الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد uh, Welcome to Jewels from the Sunnah, our daily reminder And uh, we are going actually to move into a new section of the book of manners or the book of etiquettes in Riyad al-Salihin This new section is called Babu Wada' al-Sahib wa Wasiyyatih عند فراقه لسفر وغيره والدعاء له وطلب الدعاء منه This is a section on uh, giving farewell to like a friend, an acquaintance, a family member as they travel or when you travel uh, what to advise them with and uh, making dua for them and requesting their dua قال الله تعالى ووصى بها إبراهيم بنيه ويعقوب يا بني إن الله اصطفى لكم الدين فلا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أم كنتم شهداء إذ حضر يعقوب الموت إذ قال لبنيه ما تعبدون من بعدي قالوا نعبد إلهك وإله آبائك إبراهيم وإسماعيل وإسحاق إلها واحدة ونحن له مسلمون. This is from Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, and Ibrahim uh, gave advice and gave this recommendation to his children, meaning uh, before his death. This was like his death uh, will or his death advice to them, which is to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's going to come in the verse. The same did Ya'qub alayhi salam. Prophet Ya'qub did the same. They, both of them said, O oh my children, Allah has chosen the true religion for you. So die only in a, in a state of submission and Islam to your Lord. Uh, oh, Allah says, Oh, have you been or were you among the witnesses when Ya'qub actually was on his deathbed, when he was taking his last breath, breath when he said to his children, what what would you worship after my departure after i pass on they said we worship your lord who's the lord of ibrahim and ismail and ishaq he is one lord only and we are muslims we are people who submit ourselves to him so this was the advice of the prophets to their children وَأَمَّا الْأَحَادِيثُ فَمِنْهَا حَدِيثُ زَيْدِ بْنِ أَرْقَمْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ الَّذِي سَبَقَ فِي بَابِ إِكْرَامِ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ قال قام رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فينا خطيبا فحمد الله وأثنى عليه ووعظ وذكر ثم قال أما بعد ألا أيها الناس إنما أنا بشر يوشك أن يأتي يا رسول ربي فأجيب وأنا تارك فيكم ثقلين أولهما كتاب الله فيه الهدى والنور فخذوا بكتاب الله واستمسكوا به فحث على كتاب الله ورغب فيه ثم قال وأهل بيتي أذكركم الله في أهل بيتي رواه مسلم وقد سبق بطوله So this hadith uh, is from Zayd ibn Arqam رضي الله عنه and it was mentioned previously in the book of Riyadh al-Salihin where the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, made a speech among the companion, among, the, among his companions. He praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he reminded people of, uh, he gave them a reminder, generally speaking, he admo gave, him an ad gave them an admonition. Then he said, uh, Oh people, I am just a human being and it seems that soon the messenger of my Lord will come to take uh, and to call me to uh, cross over, meaning uh, the angel of death will come and take my soul. I will, ha I will, I will pass on. And uh, I am leaving two things among you. Uh, leaving two things among you that you hold on to. And we have many versions of this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ left two things with, with his, with his ummah. Uh, and these are uh, basically these are trusts from the Prophet ﷺ. The first one he mentions is the book of Allah subhanahu wa taala. In it is the guidance and the light, so hold on to the book of Allah and uh, follow it. So the Prophet ﷺ advised that they hold on to the book of Allah and he encouraged them to do that. And then he said, and my family, my household, uh, I, I remind you by Allah with my household. This is collected by the Imam Muslim. And the point here is that the Prophet ﷺ, as he realized that is the time for his death was drawing near he started giving advice to his companions and these would be the most precious advice that the prophet ﷺ would give these are um, big reminders and uh, it was an advice generally speaking about the most important things so this is why this hadith is mentioned in this section it's about actually 
uh, giving advice and it shows us the sunnah of the prophet وسلم, that if a person is traveling or a person is dying or the person uh, because as a person travels they don't know whether they're coming back or not so they would try to give the best kind of advice that they can offer to the people they are leaving behind whether the person is traveling or the person expects to die وعن أبي سليمان ملك بن الحويرث رضي الله عنه قال أتينا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ونحن شبابة متقاربون فأقمنا عنده عشرين ليلة وكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رحيما رفيقا فظن أننا قد اشتقنا لأهلنا فظن أننا قد اشتقنا أهلنا فسألنا عمن تركنا من أهلنا فأخبرناه فقال ارجعوا إلى أهليكم فأقيموا فيهم وعلموهم ومروهم وصلوا صلاة كذا في حين كذا وصلوا كذا في حين كذا فإذا حضرت الصلاة فليؤذن لكم أحدكم وليؤمكم أكبركم متفق عليه زاد البخاري في رواية له وصلوا كما رأيتموني أصلي Okay, so this is from Malik ibn al-Huwayrith رضي الله عنه uh, he said, we came to the Prophet ﷺ or to the Messenger ﷺ as a, as a group of young men. And this is basically what this happened in the, what is called Amul Wafud, the, the year of uh, the delegates. And this is basically the ninth, this is after Fath Mecca, after the conquest of Mecca. This is year nine after Hijrah, where the... Arab tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, they all accept, decided to accept Islam, so they started sending uh, delegates or representatives who would come to the Prophet ﷺ, take the bay'ah, or give him the bay'ah, uh, swear allegiance, and uh, they would learn Islam and uh, go back to their people and teach them. So, so Malik al Hawirith was one of those with a group of his from, from his own tribe. Uh, so the uh, so he says we came to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a group of young people and we stayed with him they obviously stayed at the masjid uh, 20 nights the pro and he said the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was very gentle and merciful towards us he was very kind and uh, after this these these 20 days the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam thought that we started missing our families so he asked us about our families and it, it shows you the gentleness of and the kindness of the Prophet ﷺ. Now these are strangers who came to learn Islam. The Prophet ﷺ could have just made it business as business, right? Okay, you came to learn Islam, we're going to teach you. But they saw so much mercy and kindness from the Prophet ﷺ and this is something that they were meant to learn as well. Because the Prophet ﷺ doesn't only teach through his words and actions, but through his example, the, through the way he carried himself and the way he treated people. Because Islam is not only mere uh, acts of worship and instructions. It's a, it's a complete way of life. Everything in your life as a human being uh, could be done the Islamic way or the non-Islamic way. It could be done in a good way or a bad way. So the Prophet ﷺ noticed these young men have been here for 20 days. And the Prophet ﷺ thought these people must have started missing their families. So he sat with them and he spoke with them and he asked them about their families. He started inquiring about their families. And I'd assume he asked, pe he asked people, how many children you have? How many kids you have? How is your family doing? And he started asking them about you know, their families. And this is something that is highly appreciated, especially by strangers. Um, so he said the Prophet asked us about our families and we told him. Then he said, and then go back to your families and uh, go and settle back there that's where you that's where you belong that's where your place is imagine they could stay with the prophet and learn a lot still learn a lot more and they could stay with the prophet and enjoy his company yet the prophet says you belong there that's your place it's over there and it shows you there is always balance in islam and the prophet was a holistic kind of person his approach was holistic it wasn't only about like learning, 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 learning. It was about or about what acts of worship, acts of worship. There is balance because a person's relationship to their family, to their kids, uh, a person's emotional life and uh, emotional well-being is all part of Islam. 
and again so this is a problem that muslims sometimes bring upon themselves where they actually secularize islam itself so they consider you know they limit islam only to the obvious acts of worship and to certain things that pertain apparently pertain or are related to the to the religion but they forget that all of the aspect all aspects of our life our human life is part of islam being good to your wife is a is a part of islam a wife being good to her husband is a part of islam being kind and gentle to your kids and being a good teacher and example for your kids um taking care of your kids spending on them providing for them educating them spending time with them all of these are great acts of worship these are just part of islam and again, so we don't want to secularize Islam. This is something great that we can learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here. Uh, that um, we have comp compartmentalized Islam. We have um, technicalized Islam, if, that, if that's a word. You know, we have made Islam very technical. And we have uh, removed the spirit of Islam. We have sort of dehumanized Islam in a sense, in our own practice. I'm not saying we're doing that in theory, but we're doing that in our practice, in our approach to Islam. And there is one thing that is extremely serious that you'll find very apparent these days, and it's actually, um, it's causing a lot of trouble for our younger generation. And it's not something that we say, but it's something that is visible and apparent in, in our demeanor. We tend to assume that the, what we have in common as Muslims with other people, with non-Muslims, as if that's not Islam. As if Islam, as if we, we started to limit Islam to how Islam is different from everything else and everyone else. That is extremely problematic because even non-Muslims, they have certain aspects that come from the fitrah, that come from human nature. Now, non-Muslims are not, not everything uh, about them is evil and bad. Non-Muslims are people who don't believe in Allah as they should, and they don't believe in the Messenger of Allah as they should, and they don't practice what they are supposed to. Uh, but not, not, not completely. There are still many aspects of their human nature that are part and parcel of Islam, that are in an integral part of Islam, that these people still practice due to their human nature, due to the innate goodness that Allah put in human nature. And these are part of Islam. The fact that these people practice those aspects does not make these issues out of Islam. So when we limit Islam to only the things in which Islam stands out or, in, or only to the things that are special to Islam and Muslims, whereas the other aspects of Islam that are practiced by even non-Muslims, we tend, we tend to discount them. This is problematic. This is extremely problematic. Because there's a lot of goodness in people that Allah put in them. And these are part of Islam. So we need to see these parts as Islam. And the, I think that this kind of view comes from people, you know, uh, having a lot of, uh, coming from a position of animosity. And, and, and uh, taking Islam just as, 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 a, as a system to, to set oneself completely apart from everyone else. But we, we overdo that. Okay, this is besides the point, but I, I, I thought it was worth mentioning here. So the Prophet ﷺ, uh, said to these companions, these young companions, these strangers who came to learn Islam, after 20 days, he said, you go back to your families. That's where you belong. Settle there. Spend your time there. And teach them what you have learned and instruct them. And... The Prophet ﷺ then told them about the times for prayer. He just re-emphasized re the time for times for prayers, the five daily prayers. Um, and then he said, when the time for a prayer comes, one of you should make the adhan. And the eldest among you leads the prayer. The eldest among you read it. This is collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. In one narration by Al-Bukhari, in addition to this, and the Prophet ﷺ said, and pray as you saw me pray. Pray the same way you saw me pray. Um, let me clarify an issue here. So who has more right to do the iqama? The Prophet ﷺ said the eldest. But we have another authentic hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says لِيَ أُمَّكُمْ أَقْرَأُكُمْ أَوْ يَأُمُّ الْقَوْمَ أَقْرَأُهُمْ The person who knows more, more of the Qur'an leads any group of people. 
So if we have a group of people who are about to pray jama'ah, who has more right to be the imam? The person who knows uh, more Qur'an among them. So what about this hadith? The Prophet is saying, let the eldest among you lead you. Well, again, the context, context explains this because these are, uh, as at the beginning of the hadith, the uh, beginning of this hadith, these are young people who are almost the same age and the, all of them were fresh, were new to Islam and they came and learnt, they pretty much learnt the same things. So they were almost at the same level of knowledge of the Qur'an. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, then the eldest among you leads, because most likely these people were equal in terms of their knowledge of the Qur'an. So this shows a second criteria, which is if people are close nearby, close to each other in terms of their knowledge of the Qur'an, then the second uh, indicator as to who leads is actually the uh, older or the eldest among them. All right, so the point here in this hadith is look how the Prophet was very gentle and kind, uh, kind and when he uh, instructed those new companions to go back to their families, the Prophet ﷺ gave them advice about what he believed to be the most important thing for them, which is about the salah and about educating their families on Islam. وعن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه قال استأذنت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في العمرة فأذن وقال لا لا تنسنا يا أخي من دعائك أو لا تنسنا يا أخي من دعائك فقال كلمة ما يسرني أن لي بها الدنيا وفي رواية قال أشركنا يا أخي في دعائك رواه أبو داود والترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح so this is collected by أبو داود and الترمذي uh, from Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anhu, he said, I asked the Prophet ﷺ for permission to go to make Umrah. So they were in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ said to the Prophet ﷺ, uh, I want to go to make Umrah. The Prophet ﷺ gave him permission. And the reason he sought permission is that he was one of the close companions of the Prophet ﷺ and the Messenger ﷺ um, had him most of the time close to him for advice, for counsel and for other responsibilities. So the Prophet ﷺ allowed, uh, allowed him to go. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not forget us in your dua, or remember me in your dua. Umar al Khattab says, like, this word is worth the whole world for me. This word from the Prophet ﷺ is worth the whole world for me. And it shows it's a sunnah to actually, when a person travels, that when a person leaves, that you tell them, Remember me in your dua. That's something the Prophet ﷺ did with Umar ibn al-Khattab. وعن سالم ابن عبد الله ابن عمر أن عمر ابن أن عبد الله ابن عمر رضي الله عنهم عنهما كان يقول للرجل إذا أراد سفرا أدن مني حتى أودعك كما كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يودعنا فيقول أستودع الله دينك وأمانتك وخواتيم عملك رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن صحيح Collected by Imam Al-Tirmidhi, uh, Salim, who is the son of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiyallahu uh, anhuma. He said, Abdullah ibn Umar, radiyallahu anhuma, when a person wanted to travel or set out, uh, he would say, come close, I will give you the farewell the same way, or give you farewell the same way the Prophet sallallahu used to uh, give farewell to travelers, or used to give us when we would travel. Uh, I entrust your religion, your heart with Allah and your sense of trust and the uh, seals uh, of your deeds basically uh, how your deeds are being sealed basically I entrust you completely with Allah your religion, your deed, your acts of worship and here your spirit Amana is, is your spirit, your your spirit of worship and devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is how the Prophet ﷺ used to give farewell. Astawdi'ullah hadinaka wa amanataka wa khawatima amalik. Wa an abdillahi ibn ibn. So this is when a person travels, this is how, this is what you say to them. The traveling person, they respond, Astawdi'uka Allah alladhi la tadi'u wa da'i'uhu. I entrust you with Allah who does not 
waste whatever he's entrusted with. وعن عبد الله ابن يزيد الخطمي الصحابي رضي الله عنه قال كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أراد أن يودع الجيش قال أستودع الله دينكم وأمانتكم وخواتيم أعمالكم this, uh, this is collected by Abu Dawood and others from Abdullah ibn, ibn Yazid al-Khatmi uh, رضي الله عنه that Allah's Messenger sallallahu sallam, every time he sent a military expedition he would give them farewell by saying أستودعوا الله دينكم I entrust your religion with Allah وأمانتكم your trust which is we said your sense of devotion, the spirit of devotion وخواتيم أعمالكم and your deeds and the, 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 the finals of your deeds basically the same thing وعن أنس رضي الله عنه قال جاء رجل إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال يا رسول الله إني أريد سفرا فزودني فقال زودك الله بالتقوى قال زدني قال وغفر ذنبك قال زدني قال ويسر لك الخير حيث ما كنت رواه الترمذي وقال حديث حسن This is collected by Tirmidhi and he says it's good hadith uh, from Anas رضي الله عنه he said a man came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he said O Messenger of Allah I intend to travel so give me something provide me with something the Prophet ﷺ said may Allah provide you with taqwa and like the provisions may Allah give you the provisions of taqwa the man said increase me give me more the Prophet ﷺ said and may Allah forgive your sins and the man said give me more the Prophet ﷺ says and may Allah facilitate a good for you wherever you are okay so this is basically about the etiquettes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a person uh, was about to travel when a person was about to travel so it's a sunnah if someone travels is that you give them advice and you make dua for them and you also ask them for dua this is a sunnah you give them advice uh, a nasiha a recommendation uh, especially something about the most important things and uh, you uh, make dua for them and you ask them to remember you in their dua in their dua so again it shows how the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu is not limited only to again the visible acts of worship that we know but it's actually a very comprehensive way of life why because in everything we do in life we can make it purposeful and we can make it a good thing uh, and there is no sense of secularism in Islam that uh, oh, like you know leave leave what's what's for, what's for Caesar for Caesar and what's for God for God that that doesn't work and and this this whole statement is actually based on a false uh, appreciation of what life is the the whole story of life is Allah put us here in this world for us to worship him Allah is testing us. That's what that's what that's what life is about. So life is about Allah first and foremost, and we are an extension of this. That's it. It's not like life is there and existence is there, and then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala forces Himself on existence. That's 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 the basically the foundation of secularism. That life is there inherently there. It's like it has its in intrinsic existence and Allah has a separate existence and Allah uh, sort of forces himself on this independent existence of the world and thus yeah if you want to worship Allah you just worship Allah fine but if you just want to embrace the independence existence of life you have all the right in the world to do that that's a completely inaccurate and false understanding of what life is and, and this is what secularism is based upon. Uh, whereas, how did the world come about? Allah created it. Allah brought it into existence. How did we come, come about? Allah created us. Why did He create us? Because Allah creates with purpose. Allah doesn't do anything without a purpose. Everything is with a purpose. So what is our purpose? What is the purpose of this whole world, this whole universe? Allah created us for a reason. To test us, to try us, to separate the good ones from the bad ones Allah makes us throw, go through this the test of life and this is why he created this universe that we know 
So everything actually is about Allah. So the whole concept of secularism is a lie. Is an inaccurate approach to life. It's based on false assumptions about the meaning of existence itself. So this is why you find the way of the Prophet or the Sunnah of the Prophet And this is the message of all the Prophets and Messengers, by the way. Is that, hey, you humans, this is where you came from and this is why you came into this world. And here is comprehensive instruction to help guide you so that you can do the right things with your life. And you can navigate this world as safe as possible and come out of this world at the moment of death because everyone is going to die. Come out of this world having uh, made the best use of your time here in this world. It's as simple as that. So there is instructions, there is guidance at different levels of, obli of obligation and commitment and in every aspect of our lives. So, and, and the more you embrace that and the more you take of these etiquettes and these instructions, uh, the better position you will find yourself in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and accept from us and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our uh, prayer and our fast and our dhikr and our re recitation of the Quran. Jazakumullah khairan. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.